Hello everyone, my name is Anna Brees. It is the 25th of September 2020 and I'm very excited indeed to invite onto the channel Dr. Martin Koldorf. Now Martin is a professor in epidemiology at Harvard University's Medical School. His research centres on developing and applying surveillance methods for post-market drug and vaccine safety and the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks. He is speaking to me from Boston. He's originally from Sweden, but you've been living in, um, in America, in the United States for the last 25 or 30 years. It's 2 p.m. here. I'm in Cardiff, near Cardiff. You're in America. It's about 9 a.m. there, I think. And big news for us today in Wales. Uh, nearly half of the population is facing lockdown this weekend, which has just been uh, announced, which is, um, I think, can be very difficult for a lot of people to have to deal with that. But yeah, Cardiff and Swansea from 6 p.m. on Sunday, which is about one and a half million people here in Wales. Um, what are things like where you are? Are you in lockdown? Uh, there is, uh, uh, many of schools are closed for in-person teaching, so that is the problem. Uh, but uh, many stores are open, so it's a mix here. A mix of different things. This is the whole thing, isn't it? We don't really know what's going on around the world. I think there are some areas where there's very, very few restrictions and it doesn't really feel like anything's happening. And then there's others that's, uh, you know, see it's so in Wales, it's going to be very strange on Sunday, I think, with all of these lockdowns. And it's good to speak to people from different parts of the world. Um, and I've got an opinions channel where people have been sending in their views um, from all sorts of places, you know, New York, um, we've had people from Spain, um, and of finding out what life is like, because it's difficult to know really, it's, you know, to get an idea of what things are like all around the world. So what I want to talk to you about, Dr. Martin, is you are clearly an expert in this area of epidemiology. You know, similar to maybe someone like Professor Steve Gatto, which we've heard a lot from her. She's been on BBC Question Time recently. Um, and she's a theoretical epidemiologist at the uh, University of Oxford. You're an epidemiologist at Harvard. I've read a couple of your articles that you sent to me. One in the Spectator on the 8th of August, which I just wanted to focus on first, where you said herd immunity is still key in the fight against COVID-19, either through natural infections or vaccination. Obvious, yes. And I really um, found a lot of your articles and your publications focus on the same thing, which is age an age-targeted strategy to minimise mortality. And I love the way you put this. You were saying, so yes, we can open schools, but teachers older than 60 should work from home. Keep the pubs open, but those in their 70s should stay away for a while. Open the bowling alleys, but skip the senior league. Let kids skate with their parents and record their pirouettes for grandparents to watch at home. Open restaurants, but take out for the older folks. But it's all about the point is open society for the younger generations when they've generated herd immunity with only modest risks to themselves. The older people can come out as well and we didn't follow that strategy here in Britain so you know we're heading into a winter now where you know potentially we hadn't built up that herd immunity amongst the low risk population to protect the vulnerable this winter so why do you think this is, has not been adopted um, this particular strategy? Uh, that's a very good question and that's more of a psychological sociological and political questions uh, I mean one answer is that uh, uh, in the UK I think People are not listening to Dr. Sunetta Gupta, who is, the, in my view, the preeminent infectious disease epidemiologist in the world. I think if uh, people had been listening to her uh, earlier on, I think uh, a very different uh, approach would have been taken. She's been saying this from day one. And, and the moment we went into lockdown, I thought it was the most obvious thing to do. Um, but there's not many not everyone agrees with um sunitra gupta and your position on this um i just wanted to mention because i saw on twitter i thought this was fascinating a debate you had with dr greg gonzalez an assistant professor of epidemiology at yale school of medicine so of sort of equivalent of yours but he's an assistant professor at yale um he's actually put on twitter that, that this is a very bad take by you dr martin Kaldorf. it's practically trumpian um, it distorts facts, current public health recommendations. So he was picking on you and saying, you know, this is Trumpian. Um, and you responded, I've never heard of Trumpian epidemiology. I, like that. I haven't ever heard of Trumpian epidemiology either. Um, and it, it is beneath you and any other scientist to make political insinuations or accusations as part of scientific discourse. You said it's unhelpful and dangerous politicization of public health 
and you felt that that was sad. So you, you, you obviously have a different view to, to Yale. I would invite that uh, professor, assistant professor from Yale to come on the channel as well. What's going on here? Uh, so there are different opinions among uh, scientists. Uh, in terms of my personal contacts with people who do infectious disease technology, there are many who have uh, a very similar view as uh, myself and uh, Dr. Gupta. And as you said, I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not as like a, uh, it's sort of a very natural approach to do the age-targeted uh, strategy. Uh, it's what comes natural to public health. It's sort of based on public health practice while having major lockdowns across the board for the whole society is something that was never thought about or, or, or uh, planned uh, before 2019. Or, uh, so that's a new thing and it's sort of stunning, I think, as a, as a public health scientist to see this. And, and the key is that for COVID, uh, for the elderly, this is a very serious disease. It's uh, much worse than the annual flu, much more dangerous. Uh, on the other hand, for children, this is a very mild disease uh, and much less serious than the annual flu. So even though there are not that many children who die from the annual flu every year, there are some, but COVID-19 is even less. And we can see that, for example, from Sweden, which uh, never closed its uh, daycare centers or primary or middle schools. So all children in Sweden from ages 1 to 15 uh, were in daycare or school throughout the height of the epidemic. And among those 1.8 million children, uh, there were exactly zero deaths from COVID-19. Uh, and also we know that, so young people are not at risk uh, uh, very much from this disease. So if we want to minimize death, what we have to do is we have to do a much better job than we're doing of protecting the elderly and other high-risk uh, people. At the same time, we can let children go to school and young adults live more normal lives. Uh, and then eventually we'll build up immunity in the community. And sooner or later, whatever strategy we use, we are going to reach herd immunity. And the key thing is to minimize the number of deaths until we get there, which we do by protecting the elderly so that they do not get infected. But if it drags on for too long, it's, it's more and more difficult to protect the elderly. Uh, so what we're doing now is we're essentially protecting low-risk college students and low-risk professionals who can, young professionals who can work from home, even though the risk is minimal. At the same time, uh, Older working class people have still have to go to work to make a living um, as a bus driver or a store supermarket attendant uh, or, or a janitor, etc. So uh, we are putting them at, at risk, even though they are at high risk. So in a sense, we are protecting low risk uh, people who are more highly educated or, or privileged while throwing the working class under the bus. Absolutely. I, um, it, it makes sense. And it's obviously an opinion shared by many epidemiologists, top epidemiologists all around the world. The conversations that you have, are you in kind of a email correspondence with um, these other, you know, epidemiologists? What, what's your general feeling? Do you think they're, they have the same view of, as you? Or do you think it's sort of 50-50? Can you give any kind of guidance on the conversations you're having with other individuals with similar expertise around the world? So uh, I don't know what the percentage is among all infectious disease technologists, uh, but among those who I have personal contact with, there's a majority who agrees with the age-targeted approach and a minority uh, who pursue uh, a mixture of uh, uh, lockdowns with uh, contact tracing. So there are both opinions within, the, uh, with, within infectious disease technologists. But unfortunately, there's, there's no uh, discussion where it should be. And uh, I have, uh, there's a person uh, in, uh, in New York uh, who, uh, who runs the SOHO uh, uh, discussions. Uh, his name is Dean Epstein. He's been trying to set up uh, a discussion with uh, 
with one person from each side. And I've agreed to do it to argue for the age targeted approach, but he has uh, asked many people uh, who sort of are on the other side. And so far he has not uh, had any luck, luck finding somebody who wants to join that uh, discussion forum. And it's a prestigious discussion forum which I have had uh, many high level scientists uh, participating on a host of issues in the past. So there is a reluctance, I think, from from uh, some to actually discuss this in the open. And I think that's very bad, both for public health and for science. We need to discuss these things. Um, Maybe they're concerned, you know, so for example, the child, a five-year-old child at school comes home and they've got an 80-year-old grandparent living with them. And maybe they don't want to be responsible for promoting a herd immunity strategy when you can't separate different age groups. Is that possible? Uh, so I think that's one of the arguments they're using. And uh, we have to do a better job protecting that uh, grandparent. Uh, they are not so much at risk from the child, actually. But if they live with a son or a daughter, as well as children, they are at risk from living together with the working uh, age adult. And there was a study from Sweden where they compared the risk, the COVID risk for people above 70. And those who live with a working class adult below age 65, as I think it was 60% uh, excess risk compared to if they live with uh, somebody their own age, above 65. So there's clearly, the, the elderly clearly have an increased risk if they live with an adult which is in the working age and therefore out, uh, out and about. So uh, we need to protect those elderly. Um, uh, if, if the son or daughter that they live with cannot work from home, maybe they should live with a sibling for a while, or maybe we can use some of the empty hotel rooms uh, to house them for a while during the time when the, during the peak of the transmission in, in the community, because it is important that we protect them. And it's not trivial, but there are ways, if we want to, that we can do that. Uh, the age, so the age uh, targeted strategy, I think, is a, is a good way of summing it up, isn't it? Um, I, I want to talk to you about this. This You basically, uh, very clear, and I spoke to a guy called GP Ricochet, you get herd immunity either through vaccine or natural infection. And there's a Times article today that said one in five of the population won't take the vaccine. They don't want to. They don't think it's safe. Um, I've heard even higher figures than that. You know, some surveys suggest it's sort of up at the 40 percent range that people don't feel comfortable taking a vaccine. Um, I think it's also important to say back in June, I was contacted by an individual who is in a um, Facebook group and friend with somebody who is a top um, epidemiologist at a different university, well-known university. Um, and I'm aware that that individual um, has a very similar view to you. That, that particular individual has funding concerns uh, about speaking out. Do you think that that's possible, um, that some professors from some universities aren't speaking out because of funding issues? Uh, I think certainly there are those concerns uh, because as scientists, we apply for grants and those grants are judged by a committee. And the majority of those that committee will decide whether this particular grant is funded or not. And obviously they use scientific criteria to judge that, but this is a very uh, contentious issue. So if the majority of scientists are sort of have a different opinion, that could have uh, bad consequences down the road. And some scientists, this the example that you gave can be pretty uh, harsh in their judgment of other scientists. Uh, and of course, if that happens during a, a, a deliberation about who should get grant funding, that could have consequences. And while most of the infectious disease epidemiologists that I talked to uh, uh, agree with the age targeted strategy, among other scientists outside of that field, I think there is a majority who have a different view on this. And certainly among those scientists who are vocal about their views. So why, why is Yale, or particularly that individual at Yale, different to Harvard? 
Oh, I don't know if there's a different uh, between different universities because they, at Harvard there are people who have different views. Uh, I'm, I assume that's true at, at Yale also. At Stanford, there are people like Jay Bhattacharya and John Ioannidis uh, who are uh, very, uh, very supportive of having an age targeted strategy. But there was also a letter from 98 uh, faculty members denouncing Scott Atlas, who's also from Stanford, uh, for his views uh, without really stating what they were against. So I think each university probably have faculty uh, with different views. And that's the way it should be. That is the way it should be, shouldn't it? It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And what do you, because you're all clearly have a, a expertise in this area. Um, do you think it's, uh, what do you think is driving that? Really, what do you think is driving that? Is it, because for me, I would want the least amount of suffering. That's what I would be looking for, the least amount of suffering, not just death, suffering. Is that what's driving so, these different views? I think there are three things that drives the difference, and there might be more, but uh, I, I think there are three things. One is, uh, one can look at the pandemic in terms of COVID-19. How do we minimize death from COVID-19? How do we deal with COVID-19, like exclusively on this one disease? versus taking a more holistic public health perspective, uh, where one also looked at what, is, what are the collateral damage from the lockdowns, from school closings. And we know that they are huge because uh, we know that people don't go to the doctor uh, as much as before. And people didn't go there for fun, they go there to improve their health. So uh, there are worse uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes. People are not getting their cancer screenings. And uh, that's not going to show up in the mortality statistics this year, but somebody who, who will now maybe die three years from now instead of 15 years from now. So those are things that are, have long-term effects. Uh, we have problems with mental health. Uh, uh, house evictions is a problem in the United States now. And that has major... Uh, public health consequences in addition to everything else. Of course, education is important. So I think that some view it more, more focused on how do we deal with COVID-19, while somebody like Dr. Gupta uh, takes a very broad perspective on uh, public health. And I think that's one of the differences. Uh, another one is a traditional way to deal with infectious disease outbreaks is contact tracing, testing, and isolation. So for example, we had a few cases of uh, Ebola in the United States. And this key then, you isolate those patients, you, you uh, interview them, who are all their contacts, you test the contacts, you might isolate the contacts and so on. So that's a very traditional way to deal with many uh, infectious diseases. If we have a measles outbreak now, because we have herd immunity from measles because of vaccines, but sometimes there's an outbreak. We do the same thing. We see who has the measles, who are they in contact with, and so we try to deal with it that way. So that's a very common approach to infectious disease outbreaks. And for many outbreaks, that is the correct, the right approach. But, uh, and some people think that should be used for COVID. So my view and view of many of my colleagues is that for uh, things like the annual influenza or for COVID-19 or by definition for any pandemic, those are not feasible strategies. And uh, same true was measles before we had a vaccine. That wouldn't be a feasible strategy to deal with that. Um, so I think there's a, there's a different opinion of whether this contact tracing together with lockdowns is a feasible strategy uh, for the long term in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19. So that's sort of a more of a scientific public health difference. I think a third difference is uh, for me um, uh, as a scientist, and uh, presumably for you as a journalist, we can work from home. Uh, I still get my salary. So I don't see the major uh, uh, consequences from the various lockdown measures that is taking place. Uh, uh, 
there are certain nuisances, new, uh, but it's nothing major. But for the working class, it's a very different story. Uh, people losing their jobs, uh, people uh, not getting the health care they need, uh, kids not being able to go to school, and uh, the school closings are bad for all kids, but it's particularly bad for working class children. So I think there's a difference in perspective uh, whether you sort of see your own group of people more versus uh, thinking of the whole population, including the working class. And that's another um, aspect where Dr. Gupta, in her interviews, she always stresses that we have to think about the whole population, that we have to think about uh, the working class and the poor, and not just in the Western world, but of course in uh, all countries in the world. So I think that's the third uh, difference. And uh, there might be more that. reasons, but um, yeah. Well, uh, at the beginning of lockdown, I remember thinking, you know, the, the single mum with five children in a flat um, without any garden um, and out, maybe no support or family to help her. That's tough, you know, the, or anyone that's the, the vulnerable children. Um, but then, you know, the, the, the middle class who've on furlough getting paid and they've got a mum and dad there and support with family and friends around them is a different situation. You're right. And we often just look at our own lives, don't we? And then make judgments on how we've been impacted rather than looking at how all these different areas of society and having, you know, worked in the media. I think the media is very much a focus of this channel because I know how news is delivered to organisations such as, you know, uh, the Times or the Guardian or the Sky or BBC. It comes on a news wire and different organisations put forward surveys or statistics. And I, I don't think vulnerable children, for example, are really getting, or those victims of domestic abuse are getting their voices heard and there isn't money in it, you know, there's no PR, there's no <laughs> communication strategy for that, for those members of society. So it takes, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to know, isn't it? Because you, you only know what's around you or what's on media, media that you watch. And going back to, I think this is really important now, going back to this vaccination situation, because you said to me in the email, which I thought was really helpful, um, you know a lot about vaccine safety. So like I was saying, the Times article suggest one in five won't take the vaccine. Um, others say higher numbers than that. You said to me though, you, you, you don't wanna talk about immunology or masks or treatment options, because that's not your area of expertise. So I'm not gonna ask you about that, but I am gonna ask you about vaccine safety. So what's your position on this vaccine that's being produced? And, and I know Trump has said it should be available in November. So my position is that I don't know. Uh, and because nobody knows and it's impossible to know. So to ask if people want to take the vaccine, if people ask me, I would say, I don't know, because I don't know, we don't know what the efficacy of the vaccine is, and we don't know what the uh, safety profile of the vaccine is. Uh, so if it's a great vaccine that's 95% uh, uh, has 95% efficacy, for example, with no adverse reactions, then I would expect that most people would like to take this vaccine. But if it's a vaccine that has 50% efficacy with certain adverse reactions, then not everybody should get it. Maybe certain people should get it, but not everybody should get it. So we don't know enough about this. And it's impossible to know because this is what's being studied now in the, clinic, in the clinical trials. So it's impossible to know, but it is possible to know how long uh, it takes generally. So the vaccines that have been produced um, that we've taken before, how long do they usually take? You mean to develop? To develop, yeah. Uh, it takes usually several years. So, I mean, it's very impressive, the vaccine developers, how they have really sped up this process. Uh, so that's, uh, those scientists, uh, I'm very impressed with uh, what they're doing. Uh, there are several dozens of vaccines that are in the pipeline. Uh, I am sure that many of those are not going to be viable vaccines, but we have to hope that uh, at least one, but hopefully a few of them will be. And uh, we'll see how they will be, uh, how they perform. And what usually happens when a vaccine becomes available? So I saw someone in Russia taking one this week. Do, you, do they usually give it to like um, a certain part of the population then wait to see what happens or 
as soon as it's safe, does, is that a free for all? Basically, everyone, millions can have it. How does it work? No, I think they will prioritize it. And it's not clear, but for example, they might prioritize healthcare workers and staff at nursing homes uh, to protect uh, the residents. Uh, but it also depends on the vaccine because some vaccine might work very well in the elderly, but other vaccines might not work well in the elderly because they have a, a not as strong an immune system. So they might not. So the best thing to, the best way to protect nursing home residents might actually be to give the vaccine to the staff rather than to the residents. But that depends on the vaccine and we don't know that yet. Are we uh, definitely going to have then, a vaccine? But then, pardon, pardon? Are we definitely going to get a vaccine? We don't know for sure. I mean, for, uh, for uh, uh, HIV, we have tried to develop a vaccine for a long time. And we, there are some vaccines there, but they are not good. So there's nothing good there on the, on the market yet. So we don't know if, if, if we have a vaccine uh, by the end of this year, or if it will take a few years, or, or, or never. We don't know that. Uh, now, once a vaccine has been approved, uh, that's approved by a, 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 through the phase three clinical trials, where you have some people get the vaccine and some placebo, and you compare the efficacy as well as the, any adverse reactions. But there could be adverse reactions that are uh, much more rare or only occurs in people who didn't participate in the clinical trial. So after a vaccine is, is uh, approved, we monitor uh, the safety of that vaccine, and so I'm part of those efforts. So we would collect weekly data from everybody who gets the vaccine from the electronic health records or insurance claims data. And then once we get those weekly data about vaccines, we'll also check what happens to these afterwards. Do they get a stroke, for example? And by chance, there will be some people who had a vaccine and just by chance they got a stroke two weeks later. It has nothing to do with the vaccine. So we then have to compare if are there more people who are getting strokes after getting the vaccine versus those who don't get the vaccine? Uh, we look at many different outcomes. Uh, so there is a place for other vaccines, this vaccine surveillance to evaluate the safety. So every time there's a new vaccine coming out in the United States, we do this weekly surveillance uh, of people to see who gets it and what kind of uh, adverse reaction do they have. And in most cases, for most vaccines, they turn out to be safe. There might be some minor, there are common adverse reactions like a little rash on the arm where you have the injection site or maybe some fever. So you expect those kind of mild things from several vaccines. But for serious things, most of the vaccines uh, are, are doing very well. And there was one exception when we had a measles, mumps, rubella, varicella vaccine that came out. Uh, some about a little over 10 years ago to replace another measles vaccine. And it turned out that there was an excess risk of febrile seizures after the children, for children uh, who are 12 to 15 months old in their first dose. So we figured that out. We found that problem after 25,000 doses. And then eventually uh, that vaccine was terminated for this age group are no longer giving, and still given to people, the children at age five because there's no excess risk there, but it's no longer given to those young children. So this was an example that after 25,000 doses in, in sort of post-market use, we were able to pick up this problem. So we have similar systems in place for, uh, for COVID-19 vaccines. So after it has been approved, we will monitor its safety if something unexpected comes up, uh, we will hopefully know it as, uh, as uh, before too many people has been uh, vaccinated. Well, it's some, something that I would, uh, obviously, that's your area, isn't it? Vaccine safety, surveillance after it's been taken. And yes. uh, it would be wonderful to speak to you in the future about that and what your findings are. Do, with a vaccine, is it usually immediate reaction or can you sometimes get um, a negative impact or reaction further down the line, say six months? Or is it usually if there's a problem with the vaccine, does it... Um, become obvious straight away? So these mild things like a rash is usually immediate uh, within a few days at most. Um, the seizure one for the MMRV vaccine, that happened about a week later. 
there are other adverse reactions that could happen uh, maybe a month later. There are examples of that. Uh, but uh, it's very unusual to see reactions that happen six months down the road, uh, at least that we know about. Well, some people might be thinking, well, I'll, I'll hold back for a month, see what happens, and then I'll have it if, if nothing's, nothing's happened in a month, maybe. Um, the thing is trust as well, isn't it, at the moment? There's um, a lot of information on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter about um, some nefarious agendas of individuals like Bill Gates and that vaccines not actually needed. So why would you want to push a vaccine when we could have followed this age-targeted age, um, age targeted strategy? Um, so people have become quite suspicious. Do you pick up on that? Have you seen that? Um, yeah, first of all, if you want to wait a month, I don't see any problem with that because everybody can't get the vaccine the first month anyhow. It's going to take... Uh, at least a year, probably more, to get everybody vaccinated because there are a lot of us in this world. So uh, if somebody wants to wait a month or two, I don't think we should, uh, that's perfectly fine. There, are, well, there will be other ones who I think are eager to get the vaccine. Uh, I am worried about the trust because I think that the whole uh, conversation about COVID in general, and the strategy has not been very open. And I think that creates distrust in the population. So we have to have a much more open discussion about strategies. Uh, and that's very important. And I think one consequence of the last six months is that the, uh, the trust in science and scientists uh, uh, is taking a huge hit and we'll do it even more as uh, more and more people see what the results are of these different strategies. And that's gonna affect the trust that people have in vaccines. So I think it's important that, and then when people bring in politics also into the whole thing, that, may, that when scientists argue partly science and partly politics, like calling something Trumpian, I think that destroys a lot of trust because everybody then who don't like trust will think one thing and those who do like Trump will think the opposite. Uh, and as public health scientists, I think we need to leave that kind of a party politics out of it. And uh, we have to, in order to, uh, to have the trust among the general population and that trust is a foundation of public health. You're right. Um, interesting times and the politicization of public health. Um, like you say, trust in science is, is an issue. Trust in the media is an issue. Trust in the government is an issue. Um, but hopefully from people listening to you today, um, they've, they've got a slightly clearer picture. So I want to thank you so much for talking to me today, Dr. Martin Kaldorf, Professor in Epidemiology at Harvard University Medical School, and for your time. Is there anything I've not mentioned that I think you, you, may, you think is important at the moment? No, I think uh, very good questions, and I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, so thank you very much, Anna. I've enjoyed it too. You take care. Hope to speak to you again, especially as we get nearer to when that vaccine becomes available um, and the surveillance options that you're obviously very closely involved in. Anytime. Thank All right. You so take much. care. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.